blasting, billowing, bursting forth with the power of 10 billion butterfly sneezes. I'm Tom Bain, and this is Wine, Money, and Song. If you're interested in wines and wanting to find out the best values, please subscribe. So, is the national wine market doomed? Those are, those are very strong words. And I've been saying in the last six months or so that there are a lot of indications that the wine market is starting to spiral downwards. And it's not by two or three percent. Uh, numbers have been, you know, Bordeaux, Burgundy, uh, uh, volumes uh, 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 are, are, are like going down double digits. And how, how long can they maintain that spiral? And per capita consumption, which to me is the most important number as far as numbers, people are drinking less and it's the second year in a row. And uh, why is that happening? Uh, there's a lot of reasons, but uh, I first want to explain the difference in myself and a lot of other uh, channels. Uh, I'm not a wine enthusiast. I'm a wine professional. Uh, I've worked almost four decades in the industry and I was from the beginning when the wine, wine market was growing and uh, just forming and I came out when it was booming and I enjoyed that success. I was able to enjoy that success, increase in sales and, and through uh, uh, all the fine wines in the world all of a sudden come to being California exploded. Uh, Italian wines, uh, the quality has really uh, jacked themselves up and they make some of the greatest wines in the world. I was part of that and, and, and uh, I love the idea that I sold millions and millions and millions of dollars of wine and helped my company make money, but also I helped my customers, teaching them about wine and um, helping them understand and, and be more profitable. Yeah, I tried to make myself irreplaceable. You know, that I walked in, they thought, hey, you know, this is a guy who helps me and, and helps my business. So I'm a wine professional. I'm not rooting for wines, although I have some favorite producers and things like that, but I cover more of the business end of the wine business. And I don't have pom-poms saying, you know, this wine is great, that wine is great. You know, I talk about the qualities of wine and I want you to learn how to think for yourself and how to, how to analyze for yourself because uh, the wine business, all of the reviewers are in the wine business. They're not altruistic. They're collecting money through subscriptions, through advertisements and stuff. And they are very good. You know, they're very experienced. Uh, some of them have very good palates and, and they're very earnest. But once you put money into any equation, uh, it tends to... Uh, Mark the waters up a little bit, may I say, and uh, how how pure are uh, some of these recommendations? And 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 not to point fingers or anything like that, but I've had some wines that are highly rated that I just couldn't, uh, I wouldn't want another glass of. But it's it's very subjective too. It's very subjective. So I want to go back to the wine industry and, and, and all we doomed in this country. Uh, back in the early 70s, when I was going to school, uh, I did a thesis on the uh, future of the domestic wine market in America. And uh, I pointed out the strategies they needed to take to maximize growth in the wine industry. And uh, it, it was about 125 pages. It took me two years to do. Uh, and I did win a uh, top honors award for the paper, which I'm proud of. And what I'm even more proud of, those projections and those hypotheses I made, they were pretty much on target. 
And even to this day, some of the things that I warned against and, and, and what I promoted uh, uh, pretty much hold, hold well today. Uh, but I want to bring something to view that I worked on in this paper, uh, that why the wine market is failing in America is we're not adopting the younger segments of the wine market in now. They are not drinking wine when they're in college. They're not drinking wine right out of college. Uh, and back then when we built the wine market, I built a, um, uh, a life cycle for consumers who drank wine and how they changed their buying habits as they aged. And I'm going to superimpose this, uh, this graph that I did. And uh, the first stage, now remember, this was in the 70s. And this is when the market was very small uh, and uh, not growing. And, and, and to me, it's pivotal, pivotal to, to understand this concept. In the first stage, when people were going to college uh, back in the 70s, fruit wines were uh, the big thing. Uh, people in college, and, and you're going to crawl over and, and put your nose and hold your nose and stuff. But there were millions of cases of Boone's Farm, Apple, uh, Strawberry Hill, and grape wine sold. And they weren't even really fruit wines, you know. They were they were wines that were flavored. You know, it wasn't apple wine. It was flavored with apple. It was flavored with strawberry. But they sold millions of cases. And very light in alcohol, very easy to drink, uh, a little CO2 in it. And you could knock back a bottle. It was only 5%, like beer. Uh, and you had sangria, which was uh, red wine with citrus fruits. And, and millions of cases were sold. And these were young people from 18 to 23 uh, drinking these wines. Uh, and and uh, those were the wines that sold and some sweet rosé sold a little too. But that's what the market started to grow. And when those people, after they graduated college and they got a job and they had some income, the second stage, uh, which I call educated trade-up stage, is they traded up, they started to... Uh, drink some of the imported wines. And, and I remember back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, Bola wines, and, and there were a lot of advertisements on wines. People started to promote wines. Uh, uh, Rioniti, uh, Lambrusco, which was a light, Frizzante, uh, sparkling wine. They, they imported over 20 million cases at one time. That was huge. That was huge. And so people... Although in your mind, you don't think at it as great wine. It was wine. And they went from that wine to other wines. And that's part of the, the stage that they went through. And uh, you had the Italian wines and then the California wines. Some of the varietals started kicking in. Zinfandel, White Zinfandel. And people were picking up wines, varietal wines, imported wines, Pui Fousse, Cote de Rhone, people a little educated up. And when they hit 40, uh, they, were, they started to uh, trade up even more and they had more income. And from 40 to 55, that segment started to drink Bordeaux, Burgundy, uh, wines from Italy, Barolo, Barbaresco, uh, and, and champagne uh, and some of the better wines from California started dripping in and people started buying them. Uh, the third stage, what I call upwardly mobile. They had some money and they traveled and they tried wines overseas and they came back and they had a thirst for them. So the wine market started to grow and the prices of these wines, if you think about it, each stage you go to, the wines get more and more expensive and people have more money. And, and finally, th when the 55-year-old market happened, uh, that's what I call the mature stage. And the mature stage is when 
You become empty nesters. You don't have the kids to support anymore. You're at the peak of your earning capacity and you have the most discretionary income, or I call it DI, uh, than you ever do in your world. So you're very successful. You've traveled a lot. Uh, you've tried some of the other ones. Now you have money and you can spend it. And they started spending it on wine. And in the early 2000s, the wine market went crazy, went crazy. Uh, with Bordeaux, Burgundy, uh, Grand Marc Champagnes, boutique wines from California. Uh, uh, a lot of money all of a sudden started to be spent. And uh, it grew the wine market tremendously. And it grew the prices tremendously too. Uh, and, and, and there was still the bulk producers who made hundreds of thousands of cases or even millions of cases of certain wines. And, and they sold in grocery stores and, and out of gas stations in certain states. And, and that's good too because it puts wine on the table. But as far as that fourth stage, it, cre it created a luxury market. And the problem now with the wine market, all these stages now, these first two or three stages have disappeared. Young people do not drink wine like people that when I was 18 and 20, people were drinking wine. Even though it might have been Boone's Farm, Sangria, Lambrusco, they were drinking wine and they graduated. We don't have that. You go to a wedding now and there's very little wine there. And you go to a wedding and, and it's, it's 30 year olds, very little wine there. And they're drinking liquor, they're drinking uh, craft beers, they're drinking other things. And, and uh, you even go now to restaurants. And I remember going to restaurants, everyone had wine on the table. Everyone. And I was very proud of that when I was working in the wine industry because I thought I had something to do with that. And I thought, yeah, you know, I helped get that wine on the table. And uh, I go back today and it's besides the prices being absolutely crazy where they're pricing themselves out of the market. Uh, you don't see the wine on the table like you used to. You see mixed drinks and, and restaurants don't care basically because they're charging $15, $20 for a mixed drink. They're happy. You know, they, they, they pay maybe five bucks for the stuff that goes into the drink and, and they're making 10, $15 a drink. So they don't care. Money's money. So, what are we going to do that that whole life cycle of, of wine drinkers is basically been truncated and everyone's depending upon the aging population. And they say, oh, well, you know, we're getting older, we're getting older. And once people get to be 55, that's who drinks wines. Wrong. Oh, wrong. I go, that happened because they were drinking wines when they were young. And as they were building themselves up, traveling, they started to buy other wines and they were along in that cycle. They got educated and they started making money and traveling. They drank a little more and they expect, the marketers expect just because someone turns 55, they're going to start drinking wine. No way. That's not going to happen. So the only way that this is going to change and stop these falling markets and these markets double digit, I'm, I'm scared. They should be scared too. I, I don't know if they're scared, but uh, they should be very afraid. Now, I know a lot of these companies who own wineries own liquor companies too, so they're doing great. And if the wines don't do good, eh, the liquor does good. But as far as the wine market goes, wineries, uh, Wine growers, you know, people who grow the grapes and, and the winemakers, they have to put their heads together and, and they have to get a marketing plan that makes wines available out there along and get the younger segments involved. And uh, if they don't, if they don't, uh, you're going to see supplies just sit there and not sell. I don't care. There's more millionaires uh, growing every day. Guess what? They're not drinking wine. They're not drinking wine. So we better buckle up and have a plan. And I hope 
things change, but what I'm seeing, I'm not very optimistic.